I wonder how many of you worry about, is it time for another discovery in my life? I worry about things like that. We worry about, you wonder, is there still time to win that prize, still time to get there? Well, if that's what you're worried about, I got good news for you, because this happened to me a few years ago and changed my life, just put me in another level. And it happened in a discussion with a few geochemists. I'm an environmental microbiologist and I work with geochemists. My patients are lakes and streams and rivers. And uh, I, we were working on a lake in upstate New York called Oneida Lake. Some of you will know about this place. It's a, uh, <clears throat> characterized by the geochemists as enigmatic. It was enigmatic because there was a rate of metal reduction in this lake that was about a thousand times too fast. And these poor geochemists were going, paralyzing themselves over this. That, that's what chemists do, by the way, you should know that. Uh, and I just smiled and I said, look, this isn't a problem, this is what life does. It invents enzymes, enzymes speed up the rate of reactions. You're measuring chemistry, but you're studying biology. And they smiled and said, well, okay, that's fine. What does it have to do with this lake? And I said, well, my hunch is that the bacteria in the bottom of this lake are eating the organic carbon. And there, since there's no oxygen there, they're using the manganese oxide for respiration. And they said, you're crazy. This that can't be, manganese oxide is a rock. It's a crystalline mineral. And I said, well, I can't think of another explanation for that. So anyway, just a, a tiny bit about bacterial respiration. What is respiration? <clears throat> to a microbiologist, it's electron flow. It's not oxygen, it's electron flow. So repeat after me, electrons must flow. God, you guys are good. Okay, this is really great. So every time I raise my hands, you go, I love you guys. Okay, here we go. So <clears throat> where do the electrons come from? Some of my favorite foods. We have enzymes, they extract the electrons, they put them on the cell membrane, and the membrane goes down. That's right, if you're gonna make ATP, you have to have those electrons flowing down that energy gradient. This is how all life works, okay? So far, this is a human life as well. These are all mitochondria, right? But <clears throat> where do the electrons go? The electrons will, for all of us animals, go to oxygen. That's the only thing we know. We're kind of boring when it comes to respiration, okay? But bacteria, and if we stop that electron flow, if we stop the movement of the electrons, it doesn't take long until we're done for. We have about 20 trillion cells. Each of them is making probably 10,000 ATPs a second. That's a lot of electrons. You stop that electron flow and we're done for. Bacteria are much more clever, okay? There's a lot of different choices they have. They can use nitrate, they can use sulfate, they can use all kinds of things. So why not manganese and iron? Those were the things that were bothering my geochemist friends. The reason is uh, that it's not allowed. That's what the textbook said. That's what I was teaching in the 1980s. Okay, I said, well, this is what it says in the book. It must be right. <clears throat> That's why I don't use textbooks anymore when I teach. Okay, and the real reason is that uh, if we do aerobic respiration, oxygen goes into the internal membrane, interacts with the electrons. If we use anaerobic respiration, nitrate will go in. If we use rock respiration, sorry buddy, the rock's on the outside of the cell, the membrane's on the inside, no can do. So this was the dilemma. But my geochemist friends insisted <coughs> that it was still going on at this rate. So we got an expedition and went to the um, aquatic station that Cornell runs on Lake Oneida. And we did what we call enrichment cultures. We set up cultures, we put some sediment from the lake, we put some, something to eat, some glucose or glycerol or whatever, do hundreds of these things, and in every case, the only thing these bacteria have to breathe is manganese. Manganese oxide, that black rock you see up there. Uh, most of us wouldn't do very well with that. <clears throat> and we wait. We go down to, the, to Rome and have a nice Italian dinner, and we wait a few more days, 
and lo and behold, some of these things start turning colorless. What's happening there? Just like when we breathe in oxygen and breathe out water, these bacteria are respiring, adding their electrons to that manganese oxide, and it turns colorless. It goes into solution. Yippee, we've got something there. Okay, so we isolated an organism. We named it Schuanella, after Professor Schuan from Aberdeen, one of my favorite microbiologists, and Onidensis, after the lake that it came from. This has since become a fairly famous organism. I'm called the father of Schuanella. Just in case you didn't know what my accolades were, that's probably the most famous one I have. Okay. The, uh, <clears throat> and what I want to do is show you, I, after we got Schuanella and saw what it really did, I dragged the people in the lab together and I said, good grief, we've got something important here. We have to work on it until we understand it. And furthermore, nobody's going to believe it. And I was right on both accounts, okay, that uh, it's turned out to be pretty important and pretty interesting. What you saw there were the bacteria swimming around. <laughs> yes, they were flowing because of the oxygen, and now the oxygen's gone, and the only thing left to breathe are these chunks of manganese. And you see around the manganese, there's a huge amount of swimming. If you'd move 100 micrometers away, there's no swimming at all. So these bacteria, it's like a scuba tank. These guys are huddled around the manganese, respiring that stuff, going out to get a bite to eat, coming back to breathe, going back and forth. Uh, <clears throat> and in 18 hours, the manganese is gone. That manganese, under those conditions, should have been stable for a 1,000 years. And this is what life does. When the manganese is gone, the bacteria quit moving. They're just vibrating on, uh, and <clears throat> this is, in a certain sense, the end of the story. The reason I showed you this movie, it was the most compelling thing to convince the doubters that this was real. Sometimes all the, all the data in the world won't do it, but if you can see that manganese disappear, you know that it's real. And this is, uh, was a big trick for our work. So let's fast forward 20, 20 years. <clears throat> And what we see is we now know virtually all the genes and enzymes involved in this process. We have a suite of four proteins that we call the EET complex for extracellular electron transport. They can take those electrons from the inner membrane across the outer membrane <coughs> and reduce these metals directly. This only took 25 years to figure out, okay? This is the discovery versus the realization. But uh, it works like a charm. At this point, my geochemist friend said, thanks, Nielsen, we're done with you, okay? That was enough for them. They understood why this was going fast. But my students had quite a different view. They said, gee, minerals have a charge. Why don't we just put an electrode up there and give it the same charge as the mineral? And when they did that, the bacteria could breathe the electrode just as well as it was breathing the mineral. Without any of the, the fuss and the bother from having to have all those minerals in, the, in my experiments. So this was fantastic. Now we had a bacteria that was actually giving electrons to an electrode, <coughs> and we could actually harvest some of that energy and uh, start to use it. This ushered in about 10 years ago what we call the microbial fuel cell era in my lab, that everybody wanted to take these things and make fuel cells out of them. And from the, this is a small fuel cell that we have in the lab, about 30 mils in the anode and 30 mils in the cathode. <coughs> uh, this is where it's going. This is a 20,000 gallon uh, fuel cell that's in, uh, been assembled now in San Diego. and. Uh, is, uh, is the way of the future. This is what's happening. These things make energy. They take the dirty water and turn it into clean water, and you get paid for it. Okay, this is a good deal. And we should think about that. This is what's going to happen. In addition, it makes no sewage sludge because all of this is oxidative metabolism, and the bacteria are only growing on the membranes. So this is a very, very good uh, way to, to deal with sewage. Now, what also happened was <coughs> these uh, bacteria in the microbial fuel cell taught us a couple lessons. And the most interesting lesson I showed here, that on the cathode of the fuel cell, where the electrons are coming over, all of a sudden we got contaminating bacteria. 
And uh, this was a mystery to us because the bacteria looked very healthy and happy there. In fact, they were. They would stay alive for months. And the implication was that they were actually growing on the electrons that were coming in on the cathode. And this is what we started to look at. Pretty easy to do. You take that cathode and you incubate it somewhere else and you just ask, will these bacteria use this? And sure enough, <clears throat> we had to change our view of the world that we could use a cathode to directly supply electrons as electricity to these bacteria. And they would do aerobic respiration, they would do anaerobic respiration, and they would even, with some strains of bacteria, some nice mutant strains, use those electrons to reduce uranium and chromium and selenium, which then put those things out of solution and, and helped clean up the water. So this is a, a wild bit of microbiology none of us expected when we started, just off the shelf kind of things. And it also led to our uh, every summer fishing expeditions for undergraduates, because we now have undergraduates, we take them out to some environment, a marine sediment, freshwater sediment, you name it, and we have them measure all the electrochemistry of that environment. And then they say, well, if there's a bacteria that would like this potential, it should be right here. And they put the electrodes in. <clears throat> we call that baiting the hook, okay? Because they've now decided which, what potential those bacteria will want. And then we all break out the beer and we sit around and drink for a couple weeks until they start, the bobber stops bobbing, okay? And the bobber is just a potentiometer. And when the bacteria colonize this electrode and start giving electrons to it, you see a current. So this is the greatest kind of enrichment. You can just, uh, in fact, we can call in from the lab to our potentiometers and see when we have a fish on the line, okay? And this sounds a little funny, but this, this process that I just showed you has led to probably 200 new species of bacteria, almost none of which were ever in culture before, and many of which won't grow any place except on the electrode. So this is a new way of looking at microbiology. It's a new kind of stunning thing that really surprised all of us, I think. <clears throat> and what I'd like to end with is just a look at where, this, uh, where we are right now. Most of the things we're doing in the lab and, and in applications are waste uh, removal, water cleaning, industrial waste, human wastewater, polluted water, and my bag as an educator, this is one of the greatest t teaching tools ever. I've almost never had anything that made a microbiologist want to learn chemistry. But they can't do this if they don't know chemistry and a little bit of electrochemistry, so this is great, okay? Uh, but I think uh, <clears throat> the bigger fish are still to be caught, and I look at the area of corrosion, which I'm very interested in. And corrosion is just adding and taking away electrons from natural uh, metals and, and structural materials. And it's gonna be directly connected to this. We already see that it is. And in my area of geobiology and ecology, uh, these microbiomes that we see in the different areas are gonna be zeroed in to electron transfer of all different kinds. But more germane to this audience are the two words at the two corners that I have there. One is symbiosis and one is pathogenesis. And you all know about the human microbiome. For our 20 trillion cells, each one has probably 200 bacteria associated with it. <clears throat> Every one of those cells has a charge, and if we think the bacteria don't know about that, we're being awfully naive, okay? These bacteria, we evolved in a sea of bacteria, and we, those bacteria must know about the charges on these cells. And this is one of the biggest challenges, I think, and one of the biggest opportunities for the future medical microbiology community, which will be a heck of a lot different than it is right now, in my opinion. So <clears throat> I wanna end with just a, a little note to one of the favorite people I've ever known, Professor St. Georgie, who had a Nobel Prize, and this quote came out of his Nobel lecture. Uh, and uh, I didn't know it until I started working in this field. This is brilliant, it's exactly the way I feel about life. I'm only happy he wasn't a microbiologist because if he was, 
he would have discovered this and it would already be in the textbooks, okay? So, uh, and I'll end just with this thought that this has been an odyssey of putting up with people that said this was impossible and it probably wouldn't happen and you're on the wrong road. Don't ever believe them. Follow your hunches. Stay looking at the unusual. Embrace the unusual because there's probably some really good things to know there and try to look at old things and think new thoughts. This is the way that we go. And who knows, you may end up with a new field. Thank you very much.